he routed through a phone speaker. Do, 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 do. Thanks, Google 3A. Please note, OSP does not condone violence. <laughs> or at least, not murder. And Hello! Did you wake up from your <gasps> What's wrong with Red's audio? She is coming out of my cell phone. <laughs> I've been turned into a robot. Send help. My emotions are fading away. You don't need to hear that. What ho, fellow humans? Are you enjoying having skin today? I was a whiny little baby for 700 stanzas. They fight and everybody dies except the people we like. And the pandas win and get to rule for a while. But the world gets shittier so they decide to go hike. Dog made by Hephaestus, who is Zeus's son, that guarded Zeus as a baby, that dog was created by Hephaestus to guard Zeus, who was a baby at the time. Okay, so there's like five absurdities in that story, but the point is, Tantalus stole a dog. Who does that? It has at one point attempted to answer baby's first existential question. Where did we come from? Simple on paper, since the answer is typically your parents, but in practice, glamorous divine life. Well, except for Enki, primordial god of water, who's been napping in his private water dimension the whole time. Enki's mom, Nama, hears the gods complaining about Enki slacking off and goes to passive-aggressively slap him awake and convince him to do something about it. Enki wakes up, assesses the situation, draws up some blueprints for something that'll be really good at digging canals, and hands them off to Nama, presumably before rolling over and going back to sleep for five more minutes. Creators of humanity, and pretty soon, Enki and Ninma are both super plastered and ready to make some questionable decisions. Ninma's like, listen up, you... you listen. I can do whatever I want, right? I'm a goddess. I can make a dude with whatever fate I want, good or bad. And Enki's like, oh yeah, well anything you can do, I can do something other than that. So like, I can, um, I can make anyone have any fate, no matter what you do. So if you do something bad, I can give him something good. How about that? So Ninma grabs a big sloppy handful of that primordial creation clay and starts making dudes willy-nilly. Going to say no, so the small man drinks the chemical, and lo and behold, he gruesomely transforms into none other than Dr. Jekyll. Lanyon is too busy describing how shocked and horrified he is to communicate what exactly Jekyll says when he explains how the potion works, but he's sure to note that Jekyll tells him his small, creepy alter ego was, of course, Mr. Hyde. So Utterson turns to Jekyll's notes, and we get a very interesting snapshot of the man behind the mad science. See, while Pop calls powerful hunter goddess and the mistress of wild beasts, when the gods square up to fight each other, Hera literally beats the crap out of her with her own bow and sends her crying to Zeus. This doesn't really line up with her strong and wrathful goddess of the wilds thing, though in fairness, Artemis might be suffering from the wharf effect, especially since Hera is the most powerful goddess in the pantheon, and this scene specifically is dedicated to proving that, and more broadly to proving why the gods don't fight each other directly, but while Artemis is literally spanked and sent crying home to daddy, Apollo is portrayed a little more respect unrecognizable compared to their pop culture impact. Dracula's a grody old man with a very unsexy case of vampirism. Van Helsing's a total goofball. Frankenstein's monster is an articulate, scientifically minded genius. Lovecraft's iconic pantheon of brain-melting nightmare gods frequently take a backseat to his own racist neuroses. Victor Frankenstein's not even a doctor. It's ridiculous. Enki is praised as the highest, coolest god around. And so is his dick for some reason. The text is both unclear and physically broken in places, so hey, we're doing our best. Side note, this king better be a good boss or Enki's gonna be real disappointed. So, Ninma's pretty pissed, but Enki's not done yet. He takes the last of the clay and creates a very, very busted up dude named Umul. Umul is what is medically classified as a hot mess with an, I'm, I'm not here to sass or judge, but I think Enki might be being a bit uncreative with these good fates. Ninma should try making someone with a healthy disrespect for authority. See what Enki does about that. Anyway, fourth up, she makes a guy whose dong doesn't work. But a dude named Gabriel John Utterson, whose primary defining characteristic is that he is extremely boring. He likes taking weekly walks with his equally boring cousin, one Richard Enfield, and it's on one of these walks that Enfield breaks their comfortable miasma of boredom by recounting an interesting anecdote that happened at a nearby house. See, Enfield was walking home very late one night when he spotted two other pedestrians on a collision course, a little girl running and a man walking. The girl runs into the man, and the man bowls her over and keeps walking, prompting some very respectable out temple if Dallas will let her have her baby already. Penny Island agrees, but Hera does not, and keeps Alethea, goddess of childbirth, on a short leash for nine days and nights until the other goddesses fire off a message to kick her out of bed, and she zips down to help Lido out. Apollo is finally born, and everyone is really impressed with how cool and badass he is, and he declares that the lyre and the bow will be his symbols, and he will speak the will of Zeus. In celebration, Delos blooms with golden flowers, and, true to his word, no matter how many temples Apollo gets, his shrine at Delos is always the best. And Artemis is presumably also there, but the Homeric hymn barely mentions her, so 
and kills it, gaining the epithet Pythian and naming the place Pytho in one fell swoop. Then, of course, Apollo decides his fancy temple needs people to work at it, spots a nearby trading ship from Crete, and decides those are just the guys he needs. Obviously looking to win first place in the Simple Solution Olympics, he turns himself into a dolphin and launches himself onto the deck of the ship, furiously shaking and rattling the boat whenever they try and throw him off, so they have no choice but to leave him flopped on the deck while he summons the winds to steer them way off course. When they finally go to ground near Crissa, Apollo zips off the ship, gets the temple all shiny for the new visitors, and strolls out in all his glory to give him the good news. To honor his heroic exploit of kidnapping a ship full of sailors while shaped like a dolphin, the area is given the name Delphi. That Hyde isn't a problem, and he can get rid of him whenever he wants. So that's reassuring. The next thing that happens is a murder. A dark science. So that's a dead end. And others are different, but I'm counting this as evidence for my these guys were not always twins theory, because giving birth to twins on different islands seems wildly impractical. The ancient Greeks had some strong opinions about gender roles that might possibly be being reinforced here. Nebulous and unspecified base urges. What exactly these base urges are is literally never described, but given Victorian standards of decency, it could be anything from cannibalizing orphans to doing drag. Let's so this doesn't mean the Trojan favoring gods were automatically being framed as foreign scary bad guy gods or anything, but they were on the same side as Aphrodite, who we know was a Phoenician import god, still kind of getting her legs under her, and Ares, a god the Greeks seem to have generally disliked. And the way these two are characterized in the story is a little odd when you compare it to their later portrayals. It's that Dr. Jekyll is a much better mad scientist archetype than Victor Frankenstein. An actual doctor who keeps rigorous notes on his unethical experiments, takes responsibility for the consequences of his dark science, and uses himself as a test subject because he's not a coward? Much better mad science role model than a college dropout who ditched his first experiment for having the wrong icon. Little hit and immediately murders an old man. Oops, the problem is, killing this guy has actual serious consequences. In the Panhellenic Olympic Games, the poet Pindar tells us, No, 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 I know what they told you, but Pelops wasn't killed at that dinner. See, what happened was Poseidon took one look at him and got outrageously horny. So yeah, in this version, Pelops is carried off to Olympus for appropriately ancient Greek reasons, and this produces a rumor that he was killed, even though he's actually fine. Tantalus is still sent to Tartarus, and Tantalus, ever the dutiful host, decided that the best way to honor the gods would be to sacrifice something important to him, so he kills his son, Pelops, and cooks him for dinner. Now, there's no explanation given as to why he thought this was a good idea, because if ancient Greece had a top-tier taboo, it was killing family members, and if it had a second-string taboo, it was cannibalism. Each one is already bad, doubling down just seems double bad. So the gods figure out that's a human person, and refuse to eat, except for Demeter, who's not really paying attention because she's still super bummed out about Persephone ditching her for the underworld six months of the year, so she fails to read the room and absentmindedly eats some Pelops' shoulder. Happens to the best of us, I'm sure. Anywho, the gods are very upset with Tantalus, so they give him a stern talking to, teach him the error of his ways, and <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously they throw him into Tartarus, so flattening them into a simple caricature of themselves. People are always more complicated than the stories about them. But when the person in question is primarily known for their eternal punishment in the underworld, we can safely assume they got up to some shit. So let's talk about Tantalus. Apollo saves the unborn Asclepius from his mother's funeral pyre and gives him to Chiron to raise. Asclepius later uses his medical skills to bring someone back from the dead for money, and Zeus strikes him with life. We are solid because we banged that one time, and Poseidon's like, hell yeah, and lends him a really fast chariot so he wins the race. And I gotta say, I don't think there's a ballsier power move than getting a major deity you banged one time to be your wingman. So overall, Tantalus's crimes include family murdering, attempted cannibalism, violating the laws of hospitality by stealing from his host, and subjecting the ancient world to Agamemnon. To unwind when she scoots back to Delphi to party with her brother and the muses to sing about how they're the greatest gods in the entire pantheon. Hubris, it's okay when the gods do it. Coronis sleeps with someone else while pregnant with Apollo's kid, and Apollo gets big mad about it and sends Artemis to do some vengeance, but crucially doesn't tell her when to stop, so Artemis' divine smite leaves a lot of collateral damage, which does support the idea that Artemis and Apollo's arrows sometimes take the form of a